senior civil society. Uh, I'm the senior civil society and media development technical advisor. Over to you, Adam. Thank you very much, Adam Kaplan. Um, in this capacity here today, I'm an independent consultant. I've been associated with media development projects, many of them funded by USAID over the course of the last 20 or so years. But in this capacity here, I am a private individual speaking my own views. Um, I welcome you all. Thank you very much for, for coming today. Slobodan. Hi everyone, my name is Slobodan Blagovčan and I'm coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, I guess that I'm here because of our most visible youth initiative that we have uh, not just in Bosnia, but in the whole Western Balkan. Uh, the name of the initiative is CAT Bosnia and Herzegovina, basically citizens against terrorism. Uh, let's say that our main goal is fighting against nationalism, but uh, I can say that in Balkan in the recent years, together with the nationalists, we have this narrative that is uh, really often covered with uh, uh, false news and uh, so on. I hope that we will have time to discuss about that. Excellent. Thank you. Marius. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Marius Dragomir, and I'm the director of an institution called the Center for Media, Data, and Society, uh, based in, in Budapest and, and Vienna. Uh, we are a research center uh, covering media, doing media studies, and uh, we do mostly comparative work uh, in um, a number of countries in, in, um, internationally. And Excellent. thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, and welcome again. Jacqueline. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, good afternoon to my, my uh, fellow um, people. Um, I'm Jacqueline Lamper. I'm the CEO of RNW Media. Um, we are a uh, digital media NGO uh, building uh, communities for young people who would like to contribute to social change in their environment. And uh, social change meaning changes in attitudes, in behavior, in social norms and policies. We're active in countries like Syria, Yemen, Libya, Burundi, China, where the rights of young people to be heard are uh, under pressure. I have a, a background in uh, corporate uh, media and uh, currently uh, working in, the, in an NGO world. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Vukasin. Thank you. Uh, Vukasin Petrovic, I'm head of the fund that supports the media and the civil society organizations across Europe to counter uh, disinformation, propaganda, and malign influence. Um, we are working in around 20 countries at the moment, uh, the, as I said, you know, with uh, media and civil society on a variety of strategies and trying to implement uh, different approaches in um, trying to promote uh, human rights and democracy and uh, counter disinformation and propaganda. I'm currently with the DT Institute and over the last 20 years had a chance to work on several democracy and human rights projects across across the world. Great, Vukasin, thank you very much. Um, so let me um, uh, provide a, a few notes on logistics and, and how we're going to um, run the conversation. Then I'll do a very brief setup and then turn it over um, to Adam and then Susan, and then we'll begin the conversation with, uh, with our panelists. Uh, we are recording, as I think you see on your screen, the conversation so that this uh, uh, the proceedings of this conversation can be shared with the forum organizers. Uh, so just be mindful uh, of that. Um, we will uh, encourage you to put your questions during the course of the conversation into the chat box. To the extent that we have time, we're very tight on time, we will um, entertain uh, questions towards the end of the conversation. Um, however, I do want to note that we have uh, provided a facility for another 15 minutes following the hour for any of you who would like to stay on and uh, discuss the questions or share comments with us. We will keep the main body of the conversation as uh, billed to our, our hour, but we will have the extra 15 minutes. So uh, just know that also, um, we haven't muted the group um, entirely, so if you are uh, listening in, of course, press mute and you can unmute yourselves when, when, when you want to talk. Um, if, in fact, there's background noise, then it won't interfere with, uh, with the conversation. Um, so with that, um, in terms of how we're um, uh, going to begin, let me just uh, provide uh, a brief introduction and then we will uh, uh, kick it off and, and, uh, uh, and start the proceedings. 
Um, this is a conversation we're having, uh, again, when facts don't matter, then what that um, Adam and uh, Susan and I uh, have been having for quite some time. Uh, increasingly concerned that we have evolved into a world that we might even call a post-fact world that necessitates rethinking our assumptions and the remedies regarding countering mis, dis, and malinformation. Um, ultimately, our concern is uh, mediation of difference in society, in democracies. And therefore, we wanted to have this conversation in the context of the Summit for Democracy that will be taking place this week, hosted by the US government with some 100 countries involved, to provide an additional perspective um, on how we see um, uh, disinformation, malinformation, misinformation, uh, essentially impeding the ability of people in society to peacefully settle uh, and mediate their, their differences. Um, to be clear, we uh, are very supportive of fact-based journalism, fact-based media. That we in no way wish to suggest when we say when facts don't matter or talking about a post-fact world that we, that we don't think facts are relevant. We do think they're relevant, very relevant. It's just that we don't think in many contexts today based on our own professional experiences that they suffice. Um, that we see a world in which uh, people uh, operate now increasingly on social media in particular and information silos where they only wish to listen and interact with people who think as they do and believe as they do and do not cross over and are therefore uh, very prone to disregarding facts from other sides and increasingly susceptible to uh, falsehoods and, and, and half-truths. And so uh, we wish to take a look at uh, this world that we're now in, the operating assumptions that have guided us up to this point, uh, and whether we need to fundamentally rethink a few things. So that's our operating thesis. That's what we're going into this conversation with. Again, the setup that we have shared at the, at the website, the forum website, uh, explains, explains that uh, as well. So what I'd like to do to start is to have Adam, uh, who is um, uh, the original proponent of this thesis, elaborate it for a few minutes turn to Susan, who, um, as many of you know, uh, has uh, studied a, a wide range of counter disinformation practices and can give voice to the many different ways in which we have attempted to address this disinformation problem and have fallen short and continue to fall short. And then we want to enter into the conversation with our panelists around three basic questions. First of all, is the thesis that we're proposing right? You can push back on the thesis, you can affirm the thesis, you can challenge it, whatever your perspectives happen to be. If we find some merit, however, in the thesis, then we wanna to turn to the second question, which is what else can and must content creators and media do as a result of the situation that we're now in? And then finally, as we think about moving into the new year, uh, a year of action that the Summit for Democracy is also aiming to, to foster, um, where we might be exploring uh, actions and new areas of practice. Is there some merit in considering a new area of practice that would look at non-traditional ways of addressing disinformation? So that's the background, that's the setup. Uh, and let me uh, turn it over to, to Adam to elaborate the thesis for a few minutes to Susan, and then we will start with the first question and, and our, and our panelists, again, thank you all for joining us. And Adam, please uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, thank you for contributing and, and joining us here. Um, this is an idea that has been tickling in the back of my head now for a couple of years. Um, as I did, as I do my work in media development around the world, I'm increasingly struck by this, this, the disconnect between the way that the development community, both democracy and media, um, but also human rights um, uh, and even economic growth and, and health, um, are, are seem to me to be somewhat disconnected from the reality of the information environment in which they're working. There seems to be this assumption that if sufficiently correct facts can be put out and can be disseminated, then perceptions can be swayed and the conversation can be redirected. Information integrity can be reestablished and all of this can be fixed. The genie can be put back in the bottle. <laughs> 
this conversation that, that's been tickling in my head, and now I welcome you all to participate in, is not one to eliminate or even e e e exile those conversations. Those things are necessary. Those considerations are necessary. But what struck me is that there is a, seems to me to be an absence of the other side of the equation. What happens if we are in a situation that we cannot fix? That the new condition is in fact beyond our ability to repair it. If that's the case, then what? What is the role for media? What is the role for journalism? What is the role um, for the use of, uh, how should development or agencies consider their information environment as they proceed to move forward? This is the central question for me. I haven't found a robust conversation yet on it. There's some people that are tinkling with it, mostly they're philosophers. They're less development and, and media practitioners. But I, I'd really welcome uh, this consideration. What if we are beyond our own ability to fix this? And this isn't to negate whether or not these other things are valuable, just can we please consider the other side of this equation. And maybe in consideration of that, we can reframe or at least re add new information, new perspective to the conversation about what we might be able to try in places that are deeply conflicted, where democracy is failing, where people's ability to negotiate difference is seemingly <clears throat> deeply, deeply affected. So with that, thank you. Over to you, Susan. Thank you, Adam. Um, Hi, everyone. I, I uh, want to say that when Adam first presented this thesis, it was really quite interesting and kind of provocative for me for a number of reasons. And over the past two years, I've been doing a lot of work on countering disinformation, mostly through research, um, as Bruce said, uh, in putting together something called the USAID Disinformation Primer um, with the DRG Center for Excellence. And that assignment um, gave me the opportunity to kind of really survey the scene of who, who's doing what and what are the solutions to this disinformation problem. Um, and I'll share in the chat that resource in case you haven't seen it. Um, and, and through that exercise, uh, which was a, a huge task, um, as you all know, because you're studying these issues, every day there must be around uh, a thousand articles or more coming out on various facets of the disinformation problem. Um, the other problem, as you know, is disinformation is not new. Although technology, especially social media and internet-based communications have changed the nature of the problem. Um, and in the, the disinformation primer, we look at a number of different ways to that you can approach it, including working with technology companies, national governments directly, um, media organizations, particularly independent media, civil society-led support, um, education ministries or schools, uh, as well as uh, interfacing with donors and getting either donors like USAID or philanthropic donors to invest in these solutions. Um, a number of solutions uh, run the range from fact checking to debunking, uh, discrediting bad information, pre-bunking, uh, putting out messaging campaigns, uh, engaging in media and internet legal and policy making related work. So advocacy issues or policy making reform. And as a number of you know, um, regulatory approaches to countering disinformation are often fraught with big questions about what does it mean in terms of freedom of expression or even access to information. And other types of support could include supporting more journalism, better quality media, uh, perhaps advertising outreach and working with advertisers directly to get them to kind of do a course correction. And then as you all know, media literacy, digital literacy and information literacy are often key solutions. And yet we come back to Adam's 
thesis, which is, well, why is there so much mis and disinformation or malinformation to begin with? And when we look at the state of our democracies or societies that we live in, uh, we often feel quite frustrated because we're in this very polarized world. Uh, as we know, because of the gathering for the, the Summit for Democracy and, and other things that we're all working on, uh, democracy is not in a good place. And information and media in particular, um, while they can be quite helpful, they can often be quite corrosive. And the question really is, how do we contend with all of these issues? And of all the different ways that you can counter disinformation, which many scholars recognize as a, a kind of wicked problem, uh, meaning a problem that we can never really solve or get on top of. I think Adam's thesis is quite attractive because it, it really puts forward the question of what else can we do? And you know, are there ways that we can do more community building or mediation? And how do we use media or information or civil society led initiatives again, to mediate the problems and to approach things differently and really to kind of heal our societies. So over to you, Bruce, that's kind of a, a kind of big picture. And if you want more about all these different solutions and different approaches, the, the primer really kind of packages it all together. Great, Susan, thank you very much for that. And I think, um... Uh, by now to everyone who's joined the webinar and of course our panelists, it's clear why we're here in this particular discussion, what we uh, intend to, uh, to uh, explore. Uh, so let's just get right into it in, in the sense of uh, examining this thesis. Before we jump to new approaches, additional ways of addressing disinformation, non-traditional approaches, we want really to get the panelists perspective on the validity of the thesis itself. Uh, that we are in a time when stressing facts alone will not suffice. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to uh, begin with uh, Slobodan, if you would start us off. And if I could ask each of the panelists just to take, again, two to three minutes in addressing whether or not you subscribe to this thesis, and then we will move into the area of uh, what we would then want to do in terms of uh, additional new remedies. So Slobodan, please. Thank you, Bruce. Uh... First of all, I also want to say thanks to Suzanne. Thank you for this uh, PDF document that you gave us. Uh, I just had a quick look and I'm really glad that, uh, let's say important people are starting to understand that memes are not just for the fun. I don't know if we will have time today to speak about them and to speak about social media, but especially here on the Balkan, uh, for example, if you are talking about last elections in Montenegro, uh, we can say that we can correlate the big number of the people that went to elections. I think it was 70, 80% of them uh, uh, and a lot of youngsters actually we saw. And uh, what I'm trying to say is that, for example, memes, uh, as a things that we just uh, see on the social media. Uh, we think that uh, they are created for the fun, but mostly behind behind the, such products, uh, there is, uh, uh, I can say, a lot of people who want to, to message uh, some messages. Uh, when we are talking about the thesis that you gave us, uh, uh, Bruce and Adam, uh, first of all, I would say that even five years ago, if we had the, the same one, the answer would be just, just like now. The truth is that, uh, yeah, we live in the past uh, true society. Um, uh, also, uh, as uh, the youngest one here, I do not want to be pessimistic, but I think that the train went uh, really, really far away, um, especially because of our bureaucracy that we have to follow and to track before we start to act. Especially if we are talking about right wing the organizations, not just in the Balkan, but also the whole Europe. We have a situation with Hungary, with Slovenia, with some more European countries here that is, uh, that is obvious that they do not wait for any, uh, I don't know, papers. They do not wait for any approvals, but they start their campaigns uh, that I, I can say right now, at least if you are talking about social media, they are ruining, they are ruining definitely society. So my, 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 my final answer is that uh, uh, the f we have a huge issue with, uh, with uh, uh, a lot of 
not just portals, not just meme page, but I would say right now, even some governments that are more than happy to provide us with a uh, false news. Uh, also, if I can speak about Balkan, I mean, I'm not coming from Serbia, but we are really close. For example, there we have the government that has all televisions under their control, all five national frequencies. And you can just imagine uh, how is that going every day? Uh, the, 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 the only one narrative is being placed to the people. Uh, if you ask me what we have to do as a counter so, so yeah. if I could just interrupt, hang on to what sure. we must need to do, because that's really a going into okay. the second question. Thank you so much. Let me uh, sure. let me go to Marius. And we'll do the we'll do the first round on the on the first question. Great, thanks. Yes, uh, uh, well, I I think the uh, just to address the uh, the assumption, uh, I think the the assumption is is valid. Uh, what uh, where I see a problem is. I think with uh, so uh, there is not facts are not enough. I think we have. Well, if if you want listening to you, if you want um, uh, a brief answer, I think what is more important is to um, uh, bolster the understanding of facts. Uh, that's that's what we we are in fact missing in many countries. <laughs> that's the real problem. But um, when when I'm talking about the approach, um, I just want to uh, because um, uh, what I what I think is the. Uh, uh, what I think is needed is uh, addressing the systemic failings of the, uh, the, the media, however you want to call it, ecosystem or environment. Um, and yes, uh, uh, misinformation is not new. We, we know that. Uh, but also we tend to, uh, uh, we tend to forget when we support uh, uh, fact-checking um, initiatives. And, and by the way, they are great. And all these initiatives over the past years, decades now have been have been very useful but um, uh, looking at that and trying to counter misinformation uh, by only by checking facts without thinking about the big structural problems of the media systems I think is 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 uh, uh, really the the, the te a terribly wrong approach um, because um, it, it just if we think about misinformation this is not uh, what we we have to really think about the historical trends here. If we think about, and this is another myth that we have to to uh, to struggle with: the fact that everything was great some 30 years ago. We had independent media everywhere, and suddenly um, everything is bad in all the countries. Misinformation is is uh, spread everywhere, and this is not actually the truth. We had, in fact, many years ago, the dominance of the propaganda model in many countries in the world. We had in the pre-internet era, and we still have in many countries, including some countries where you don't you, you wouldn't expect it like UK and Australia, you have corruption in the media, you have um, very low quality of the media. We just we just published a report on the UK uh, media system, 300 pages of analysis, and it's not as, as good as we would think. It's, you, we have a really, we have many, many bad players within the mainstream field as well. Um, of course, we had many years ago problems with concentration of ownership, which is a problem that, uh, that uh, Slobodan mentioned, it's coming from that. And if you think about all these trends and many more and try to connect them with the trends today, you, you really understand what is happening. You understand why uh, there is such a poor, first of all, the, the, the poor understanding by many media outlets of the audience is a big problem. Uh, we, we build media, media outlets without all the time uh, really understanding the audiences we serve. Um, we, if we think about all these things, we can also explain the media capture problem, which is a, a huge problem we, we see expanding in, uh, to many, uh, many more countries. Uh, we also see a, a huge problem with, the, again, the propaganda model um, uh, spread even more than 30 years ago. Uh, again, I, I want to refer to a study on state media we just published, and 80% of all the state media in the world that we analyzed, 151 countries are state controlled. Uh, but what is really astonishing was that uh, of the of this almost uh, 500 or 50 uh, media outlets, uh, 100 uh, media outlets uh, who enjoy editor that enjoy editorial independence, of those only 18 media in the world, 18 media are truly public service media, independent public media, and most of them in Europe. So if you really think about that, I, I'm just giving that example because we do not, this media do not operate like in the 80s in a given, um, in a given national context, but they really operate globally today. And that is a huge problem because it's not the, the fact that you have bad media in China is not bad for China, but it's bad for media in Spain and anywhere else. These media are available everywhere. So I thinking about that, and I can continue like that for for, for hours, but I will stop here. Uh, I, I made I made this point because I think the the issue here 
is addressing, and that's why I was talking about the wrong approach, is addressing the systemic failings. If we have, if you have a working media system, then you, you do not people, you do not need people to, to check facts because these uh, misinformation websites will be outperformed. They will be kicked out of the market by the actual media system. If you have a, an independent media environment, you do not need anything else because again, these outlets will not find their audience. So, and um, um, saying that, of course, it's not easy. It sounds, it sounds easy, but this is probably the most difficult thing to rebuild the media systems and technologies in the world. Thank right. you. Thank, thank you, Marius. And I, and I want to acknowledge something here. Um, and I'm also paying attention to comments in the chat and things that Adam and Susan and I have heard before in our conversations around this thesis. Um, just to be clear, in our view, we're not uh, presupposing that there was a, a mythical, uh, a perfect factual world at one point in time. We don't subscribe to a Garden of Eden uh, thesis here, that things were perfect. Um, we are mindful, in addition to media systems, the pervasiveness and velocity of information because of social media, and that essentially, as we all know, uh, content generation and distribution has now gone viral and it's in everyone's hands. So the notion of information spread and disinformation, misinformation, malinformation has a lot, of course, to do with the fact that the democratization of information is what we're currently living. No one controls it. And this is a, this is a, a huge problem that we have to contend with as we think about reaching audiences and about this bigger problem we're addressing of how do you peacefully mediate difference in society if people cannot agree on basic facts. And when the provision of those facts is now outside in many contexts, the hands of the traditional gatekeepers, the professional journalists and content creators. So I just wanted to mention that we understand that there never was a time in the world when things were perfect in terms of information. But let me continue to go around on this first question with our panelists. Jacqueline, please come in. Yeah, thank you, um, uh, Bruce. And, uh, and actually, um, I'm echoing what uh, Slobodan and Marius, but also you just mentioned. Unfortunately, I would like to confirm the thesis. Um, I think uh, stressing facts alone will not suffice. Um, and uh, what we see as biggest challenges is uh, the inability of people to identify trusted sources of in uh, information. And you mentioned it yourself especially now that um, uh, social media have uh, come up so, so drastically with uh, content generation and distri distribution in everybody's hands. And um, that uh, is one of the areas which is causing uh, the, the issue. Um, it's also about um, access to uh, fact-based information in a language or a format which is easy to understand for the audience. And that's not always uh, the case. So it is also about uh, skills uh, needed to, to interpret, to identify and to understand whether it's a trustful uh, source or not. And um, I believe it's also, about, uh, you also see a lack of trust um, and sticking to the community you know, uh, whether uh, this community is really looking at uh, trust, trusted information or is, uh, is uh, spreading uh, fake news or fake information. So it's also about a, a lack of trust in the, the general uh, information sources you see. So I think these are adding to uh, what Marius and, uh, and Slobodan and you have uh, brought forward already, and, and Suzanne and uh, Adam, of course. Great, thank you, Jacqueline. Bukasin. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and now I'm actually going to provide a slightly more optimistic, uh, I would say, um, view of the situation that we currently find ourselves in. You know, first, uh, I would argue that, you know, information was never enough, you know, and that is because we humans are not rational, but emotional beings. 
you know, and that, you know, uh, this information and propaganda are not invented uh, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. They existed since uh, human and societies existed. You know, what I believe that has changed uh, over the last 20 to 30 years is that in the past, our societies had a consensus about system of values. You know, that overall, you know, we all believed in liberal democracy and that those values have been reinforced by stakeholders and institutions. You know, and that those system of value was upholded by simple, cohesive informational ecosystems. You know, and that today, you know, we are facing a slightly different situation that is where, you know, not all stakeholders and institutions do not promote the same values, you know, and their informational system is more complex, divergent. And that, you know, on top of that, we have malign actors that purposefully try to undermine the trust in the value system. You know, and the system of values is critical for how we as human beings, uh, uh, how, how we uh, select information, how we perceive information, how we analyze information. And the fact that, you know, now we are talking about one or we are talking more than one system of values actually brings us to the point where, you know, we see different truths, you know, and uh, from my perspective, you know, information still matters. You know, all our research shows that even in the countries that are most vulnerable to this information propaganda, people do recognize that this information is a problem. People do seek facts. People do look for trusted sources. The problem is that we do not agree on what are those trusted sources and what are, you know, what information is correct or not correct. And that is where you're talking about polarization. Now, you know, do I believe that we can have the complete transformation of uh, informational ecosystem and democratic societies? No. You know, we have to understand and accept that full extension of lies, disinformation, and propaganda from our informational ecosystem is impossible. And we have to start developing our response based on that, that, you know, we and we will coexist and we will find ourselves, I would say, forever, for the rest of the uh, days uh, dealing with malign actors, actors and dealing with situation in which this information and propaganda exists and coexist with our content. Vukasin, let me um, uh, st stay with you uh, and begin consideration of the second question then, and we'll work backwards uh, with, our, with our panelists. Um, I'd like you to go back to what you were just saying with respect to the importance of shared values and elaborate on that as a way of, if this thesis has some merit, um, again, we're not presuming there ever was a perfect information world. We recognize disinformation propaganda been around forever. What we are all seeing, however, is again, this problem that we're talking about, which is the pervasiveness that is of disinformation and the problem we really are focused on ultimately the mediation of difference, how people can come together and peacefully resolve their differences in society. The values piece strikes us, we've had these conversations, Adam, Susan and I, strike, strike, that, that piece strikes us as very important. Talk to that, what can media do on the, on the issue of shared values? We can actually start uh you know, promoting uh, democratic values and demo democracy more systematically in our content, you know, and I'm talking here beyond the news content. We overall over the last 10 to 20 years do really bad job in representing uh, issues of human rights and democracy in pop culture, you know, and news and non-news media content, you know, we are so much focused on undermining actually ourselves, you know, by uh, focusing too much on negative uh, uh, aspects, we are, we are focused too much on, you know, showing how uh, democratic institutions are failing, showing how politicians are corrupt, and showing, you know, how system doesn't work. What we need to do is systematically uh, engaging in ensuring that content that we are supporting uh, promotes these values, promotes attitudes and behaviors that support 
not confrontational engagement that support the democratic participation and then at the same time discourage attitudes and behaviors that are you know calling for for opposite you know and uh, uh, we have to do that through several different ways you know uh, there are already so many examples about good content you know uh, and i can mention you know like for example in serbia there is a you know theater show that is now going online called the editor that is about integrity of the journal. You know, there is a 90 days uh, TV, TV series in Nigeria that talks about local governors. You know, so there are, you know, examples here and there about content that focuses on social and behavioral change communication, that focuses on systematically integrating behavioral approach to communication in order to challenge undesirable norms and promote the desirable norms. And that is one of the key things that we have to do going forward. This is, this is a very exciting point, at least from my perspective, and we're having this conversation with all of us here because uh, Vukasin, typically when we speak about journalism um, and media content creation, we, we rarely, in my experience, in the traditional worlds of journalism, talk about social and behavior change communication, because typically journalists do not wish to own outcomes of that sort. They don't wish to engage in that. And I, and I, I think you're on to a really good point here. If I could um, just then go to Jacqueline and then the other panelists, and if we have time, we'll come back to this. Uh, but thank you for raising these points. I think they're critical. Um, Jacqueline, we're on the second question now about if there's merit in the thesis, what do content creators and media, what do they need to do? So please uh, offer your thoughts on that. Yeah, and there I also have a more uh, positive approach. Um, I think it's really important to look at uh, content uh, with a positive tone of voice and, and use it, bringing it and turning it into uh, a mix of serious content and fun content to attract your uh, audience. What, what we see is that um, in creating uh, large communities of young people, it's really important to work with young people for young people to make sure you use the tools they, they use to get information, uh, but also to give them an, a safe space where they can express themselves. Uh, in all their diversity. So that's a second element. It's really important to build a community where you have a broad uh, spectrum of all kinds of opinions and that you work with uh, moderation strategies to make sure that those opinions are all heard in a safe space without, um, uh, without any opinionating and um, in, uh, in a way that uh, the young people feel themselves safe to, uh, to express them. So there are different perspectives. They, they need to be uh, treated in a respectful way. And um, so building communities uh, of young people for young people and making sure that we use their tone of voice, but also that we use their the, 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 the current... Uh, digital technologies to attract as many young people uh, to see what their needs are, what they, uh, what their, um, what kind of information they're looking for, and then offering the content in a way that they understand how it can serve their, uh, their purpose. And um, I have some examples. I think I would like to use one, uh, the Yaga bloggers in uh, Burundi. That is a, a, a blogger uh, group of uh, over 100 bloggers who were asked to tackle the mis dis mal information around COVID. Why? Because they have proven to be very effective in engaging with young people in a safe space. Young people could ask questions on sensitive topics and they will, were always heard, listened to, and their questions were answered in a respectful way. So WHO asked the Burundi bloggers to tackle um, the, the, the COVID uh, fake news and misinformation in such a way that young people knew where to go to. And I think these examples for us are core to learn from. Uh, we work with local um, digital media uh, youth-led organizations who know what the problems are, who know what the needs are of young people, who know how to aspire young people and, and use their language 
and who also know how to build uh, those skills to uh, yeah to um, uh, interpret uh, the information they get. So um, my shorthand would be then um, you're speaking to the importance of building inclusive, pluralistic, digital communities of young people in which there is a sense of trust uh, and, and shared values that their opinions will be respected. Um, Vukasin was referring to also shared values and the notion of social and behavior change communication as being um, a new practice area. It's not new, but new in terms of the context that we're discussing here potentially. Um, so I'm just quickly capturing what you two have just said, and I want to move to, to Marius and Slobodan to get their views on this. So Marius, please talk to us about how you see the possibility of addressing this problem potentially from non-traditional uh, means. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, if I if I am to refer to what I see as the, the major problem of the, uh, that that we have, uh, and where the uh, the disinformation related problems arise, I think uh, the the answer. I'm talking here about the systemic failings. I think the answer there is uh, on the one hand policy. Somebody was asking what is the answer. Three answers: policy, policy, policy. Uh, so one would be policy, and the second would be, in my view, media literacy. And um, we we can talk about that a lot. But if I uh, am to address your question what can media and content creators can do um, I and um, this is also coming from some years of research um, in, in various projects we have run at the center I think there are many things we can do and um, um, uh, Jacqueline and Lucas mentioned already uh, a few very important ones but I just want to refer to two one is um, I think that the media outlets need to reframe completely reframe their engagement with the audiences um, and this is not criticism this is just um, uh, the in many media outlets and of course some of them uh, do some of them uh, uh, fail in that others are doing a better job but uh, still many journalists believe uh, or think like you know in the 10 15 years ago when they believe that if they produce copy uh, people will come and read it and it's not it's not like that and think and we have seen even uh, the, the problem in in covering these issues and doing this job and covering the issues that Jacqueline was uh, was mentioning is great the problem is in very captured environments where you cannot actually cover what you want or even if you cover you are pushed out of the margin so that's that's another problem but still even in such uh, such very highly captured environments we have seen a lot of good examples if, you, if we refer to Hungary, which is a, a really a bad case of media capture in Europe, uh, we have seen recently the emergence of, of uh, uh, a network of uh, young news portals that, that are having an increasing, uh, uh, an increasing success with the public. We saw in Slovakia a media outlet that was set up from scratch that, that became profitable after three years, mainly through subscriptions and so on and so forth. So th there is space there. And the second thing that, that should be done, and it, again, it has to do with this effort of reframing the, um, uh, the rapport with, uh, with the audiences by uh, trying to think about new ways of operating in the media system. It's, again, some of the media outlets, they are set up and they, they think that the job, the job of the journalist is ended after they file the copy, but it's not there. And um, one of the, there can be many models. We, uh, the, the, the one that we have tested and it was quite successful is the engagement between media outlets and um, universities, academic establishments. That, has, that is really working. And it's not only a matter of content creation, but also a great way of uh, putting together resources and uh, optimizing, if you want, uh, resourcing, uh, resources in producing very good journalism. So Marius, um, if I um, am, am understanding you correctly, you, you do think you stress policy, policy, policy on the one hand, but then again, in terms of actual what, what media con and content creators can do, uh, you think that a further uh, sort of professionalization of media uh, actually can help address this problem. That is to say, traditional measures of just producing better content, uh, engaging in media literacy efforts to, in, to bring the consumers uh, into greater awareness of the content that they're consuming, that those are remedies that, that are valid, e even though we're looking at this pervasive problem of many people, even when these programs are in place, disregarding facts. Yes, okay. absolutely. If, okay. if you want, I, yeah, I can elaborate on that. It's uh, I think that is the tension. And just very briefly, on the one hand, 
you have these capture environments where external factors um, um, uh, encroach upon independent journalism. And again, look at Hungary. You, you, if you want to work in the media, you have three, four options. The rest is, is controlled by the state. Uh, so what do you do in such an environment? And um, yes, the, the question there is how do you engage you know, with policymakers there? That's a different discussion, but you still can. In fact, and in and on the other hand, you have small media outlets that appear and do, do a really good job, and from there you can actually build opposition to, to the systems. That has to be done because if you don't do even that, then there is nothing left. And and in fact, in time, you can build really good and resilient media outlets. Fantastic. Okay, great. I just wanted to be clear that I understood you. Um, uh, that's great. Thanks so much, uh, Slobodan. Please come into the conversation and address from your perspective what media and content creators. Uh, should do? Uh, first of all, I think that we have to uh, find solutions to help to the fact-checking portals. Uh, please have in mind that all the time I'm talking about Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, uh, about Balkan, and that's only insights that I, I have and that I can give. Uh, for example, in each of the countries here on the Western Balkan, we have one up to two only fact-checking portals who are working uh, uh, we're working a lot, uh, and the, the real reason is because the every day we have something that we call here portal. It's more and more of, of, of such portal. Someone mentioned uh, working with influencers. I think it was uh, Jacqueline, uh, and I think that is also one of the solutions that we have to be aware that we shouldn't target those uh, what we call big influencers but rather to go to work uh, with a uh, mini influencers. Uh, for example, if we are talking about uh, Instagram uh, influencers is, is the people that has up to 10,000 of their followers. That's the people that let's say uh, their audience um, rather believe to them than to someone that has half million, one million or, 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 or more thousands of the, of the, of the followers. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, also, I wanted to compare that uh, mostly what I read is that uh, the countries with a bad education system, uh, let's say they are more fertile ground uh, for misinformation media. And I think that Balkan is one of the, unfortunately, one of the good showcases that is showing that. And when we are talking about investing in youth, I think that uh, it's definitely something that we have to do. Uh, because formal education system is, I would say right now, not just outdated, but I would say that it's also part of the whole misinformation, misinformation propaganda strategy. Uh, so I don't know, maybe in, the, maybe in the future we should pay more attention how to drag young, youngsters, how to bring them uh, under our umbrella and how to give them more opportunity, not just to teach them how to fact check, but also how to create their own content, how to uh, also to, let's say, uh, to give them the uh, uh, right influencers that they should track, that they should follow. The, one of the things that uh, uh, recently happened and they are really good, at least here in Bosnia, is that, for example, when we have media that is under control of the, or influencers even, not just media that is under control of some uh, malicious uh, foreign uh, foreign influence, it's written like uh, it's under control, for example, Russia, it's under control of China. I don't know about European countries, but for example, I think that it's the really thing that can help uh, for, especially for the younger generations. When we are talking about older generations, unfortunately, <laughs> I think that uh, uh, it will be very harder to, 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 to uh, to work with them on, on, on a such issue because people, when they have 40, 50 years, they think that they know everything and that uh, they are not really will to change, not just themselves, but also their opinions. Right now, I'm talking about neighbors, my, my family and so on. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's pretty much that. Uh, I would just like to underline that working with influencers is not uh, only helpful, it's way better that we are working with many influencers with more people it's cheaper and uh, also the benefits and results are way better i mean we did it like that and uh, i would say that one of the reasons why we are the most visible youth here so thank you very much and, and, and yeah yeah we, we certainly um don't want to be in the category of being impervious to changing our perspectives. So let me just uh, uh, note um, that there's been some active conversation in the chat. And I wonder if I could just sort of break format here just for a moment 
uh, Barbara Bukowska, if you're still with us, uh, you've commented in the chat uh, about the importance of fixing digital market failures uh, as being really important to this conversation. And I, uh, I, I would invite you, if you wanted to come in for a minute or so and just uh, explain your perspective on this, I think it would uh, further enrich the conversation we're having. Yeah, hi everyone. Sorry, I don't I, I don't want to interrupt the, the speakers and I actually unfortunately have to leave in a few minutes. But my my point was more than like, you know, we are so fixated on dealing with this information or dealing with the content. And uh, instead I support what was said before by I think Adam mm -hmm. about uh, and, and Darius about fixing actually the the market, because this is really the, the failure of the digital market. And the failure of the market is by the dominance of certain platforms, because a lot of these problems you are discussing today would not be here if the business model of those dominant companies was different, if it was not based on uh, the data extraction and then personalization of, of the content. And personalization of the content that has more mm -hmm. um, cap capacity to get viral. Right, so the content which is appealing to like fear, outrage, and, and so on. So, so this is what we can fix with the regulation, and that can be can be addressed through you know asymmetric measures towards large companies where the majority of the people is currently, but also forcing them to change the business model, and uh, that's what uh, what the the market regulation has been here always for, right? And you know, Article 19 has been working on. But it's tools how this can be done through unbundling different services and introducing alternative players to this media ecosystem through through uh, regulation and through regulator actually making these companies to do so. So these are the measures which do not focus on the content, right? So which will not try to remove like information, money information, or whatever you call. This, this problematic content, but it will address the underlying um, failure of the market, right? So that's number one. But number two, actually, I would also want to challenge some of the issues which have been said before that we think that it's, um, it's social media and the internet, which is leading to polarized societies. But I think that actually it's the other way around, that, that this information and these problems are actually a symptom of a much deeper social problems, you know, market, market downturn, social inequality, um, the, 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 the huge kind of uh, problems, um, economic problems in the society. And sorry, this is a very kind of Marxist attitude, but, but really we will not solve any of these problems and we will not solve the problem in trust in the society or how people are drawn to this content if we do not address offline problems, right? And really the disinformation has always been a symptom of deeper economic and social problem, not the cause of them. Right, thank, thank you very much for that. I am, I wanna to go to Adam who has his hand up and anyone else. We have three minutes left in the body of the conversation that we planned the full hour. And I want to um, note that uh, we do want to look at what the next year might bring in, in terms of continued activity conversation uh, discussion around the issues that we're talking about here. So I want to, Adam, please come in and then I'd like to get very quickly uh, suggestions or simply affirmation from the panelists and anyone on the call uh, around how we might explore a new area of practice into 2022. So Adam, please, and Jacqueline. Thank you very much. Yes, Barbara, I, I completely agree with you. These these are deep systemic problems. Um, uh, the, the, the underlying premise of my idea, my, 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 the central idea here is not that not addressing them is, a, is, is, is something we should, uh, a track we should take. We need to address them, there is no question. My concern though is that the incentives are arrayed against us in the fundamental realignment of either the economic systems of media the political systems that support that because they are deeply entwined and, uh, and mutually beneficial and our own inability to get out of our own emotional response in this information space present us with a challenge that just may in fact not 
be fixable. We may be able to correct components of it, but systemically, it may just be beyond our capacity. And if that is the case, and this is the question that I'd like to reframe maybe for the next, for the last minute from everybody, or if we have, a, we can go a little bit longer. What else then? What else then? How then might we proceed to reimagine what civil discourse looks like if we are not able to fix the information systems that surround us? What then is the next step in terms of the reconstitution of some form of mechanism to mediate difference? And that for me is the central problem. I don't suggest that we, that we should not try to fix it. Much of the conversation around the Democracy Summit is, is, is fundamentally focused on how we fix those things. I'm not suggesting that's not a good conversation. This is the other conversation. What happens if we can't? And that for me is, I, I welcome everybody involved here to, to suggest for as long as we can stay on. What is it that we might look at over the next period of time for ways to reconsider this problem set and what else we might be able to do if we cannot fix this. Thanks, Adam. That's great. And Jacqueline, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, and I, I would, uh, I would um, like to cut it into pieces. I think uh, systemic change is needed and uh, the digital market plays a big role. I do think we also need to look at the perspectives of young people, in our case, young people, but, uh, the perspectives of the, of the audience. What do they need and how can we make sure that they connect and um, are uh, able to, to look at... Um, uh, information and I think investing in moderation strategies where we bring uh, diverse groups of people uh, together and and make sure that they are able to have an uh, a, a dialogue in a respectful way listening uh, to other opinions but also uh, sharing their own opinions and able to put it all together and and and, and build their own uh, uh, story to uh, make an informed decision. That's the other side I would uh, try to look at. And that is about a digital media organization, which is focusing on change in society. And I think the, the role of uh, media organizations has completely changed. Um, so digital media organizations really enter into uh, an interaction. It's not uh, at uh, it, it's not about uh, spreading messages anymore. It's really about interacting with your audience and listening, answering their questions, but also trying to build their perspectives. And I can go on for ages, but I'll stop here. Thanks. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, we are just now. Um, uh, past time. So anyone who has to leave the conversation, we understand that. Uh, we build it as an hour. We do have another 15 minutes or 13 minutes now to continue the conversation. Um, Adam has laid out a very provocative question. It was our third question here about what the next year might look like and how we would go forward. So um, I want to invite our panelists and then anyone on the call uh, to come into this conversation now and give us some thoughts about what are some of the next steps we might take uh, what if, again, as Adam says, the system is not fixable, or um, even if parts of it could be remedied, do we still not have a problem that uh, Jacqueline is referring to here in terms of the trust we wish to establish and the shared values within communities of people who will listen to one another and will engage in mediating difference without resorting to violence? which ultimately, again, is a concern that we have in the context of uh, building democracy and the Summit for Democracy conversation. Um, so let's, uh, let's, uh, let's move it. Marius, please come in. And then- sure, uh, I think, and I then think Vukasin, Vukasin raised first, Tisan. Yeah, Vukasin, Vukasin, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Vukasin. Thank you, thank you. So look, uh, first, uh, I have to say, you know, uh, I'm a big uh, fan of game theory. You know, and from my perspective, you know, this, we are not in a zero sum game here. You know, this is an infinite game, you know, and there is no winners or losers. So, you know, in this sense, you know, we might be behind in terms of, uh, you know, being able to uh, inform edu and educate, uh, you know, uh, uh, audiences and uh, uh, to create or to support creation of, you know, what, citizens in, in democracies. But we didn't lose this, 
I would say again, you know. So uh, if you if you ask me, the, uh, the goal is, you know, what are the things that are under our control? And what is that, you know, that then we have to double down on those, you know, that are under, uh, under our control. Supply of good, good information is under our control. We have to double down on support of good information. You know, uh, as we were talking, you know, normative approach, you know, and the representation of human rights and democracy content is under our control. You know, we have to double down on how we represent, you know, issues and values that are of importance for us. And that will bring us to the point where, you know, we can have societies with the shared values that are ready to, to dialogue. You know, so uh, I would say, you know, thinking thinking about those those things is important for me. You know, and going uh, going forward, you know, like in the next year, and this is something that uh, administrators Manta Powers mentioned. I truly believe in uh, a brain and behavioral approach to human rights and democracy. You know, and if we are talking about you know new aspect of media work, it's exactly this. You know, it's being systematic about how we represent values that are going to bring us to a point where communities that do not share the same opinion share same system values and are ready to discuss it. You know, so, so that is that that is one. You know, second one is you know, and a lot of people mentioned the you know issue of uh, of a policy and the issue uh, issue issue of. Uh, uh, good information or, you know, different ways in which we have to do this. So uh, I will put policy aside for a second. From my perspective, the key is if people spend eight, on average, eight, midi, eight hours a day consuming media, you know, it's not how we produce one TV series or it's not uh, how we engage with one content, with one uh, uh, social media a platform on how they moderate their policy. It's how we can ensure that we dominate these eight hours during which people consume information online, uh, uh, during which they create attitudes and opinions that then inform their behaviors and further reinforce norms in their in their in their communities. So, you know, I would say one is doubling down on supply of good information, doubling down on how they represent the issues of human rights and democracy. And then I would say it's a coordination between different stakeholders, media, civil society, influencers, political parties, you know, and all others that uphold our system to ensure that during those eight hours, uh, audiences do receive uh, uh, type of content that reinforces the system of values that we believe in. Great, thank you. Um, Marius. Yes, uh, very briefly be before I go, I think uh, uh, the thing that I, I kept repeating here, I will reinforce it and this is this is policy. And I just want to add the fact that um, uh, some many years ago, I used to work for a donor organization and we used to do policy work. And there was a time 10, 15 years ago when a lot of uh, organizations, especially those that, that are supporting uh, media development have retreated or, uh, from policy or stopped funding that. And I think what we have here today is, is partly a result of that. If you if you, if you have if you have um, uh, working business uh, working uh, funding models, if you have um, models of fighting capture, if you have regulations that prioritize content and all that, this is all policy. If you don't have that, then w you have what we have today. Um, so a return to that in a very serious way is very important. I, and I remember the discussions back then. Everybody was uh, quite anxious about that because it's in policy. You see the results after many years. Yes, it's true. Everybody was complaining. We invest today, and we see the results in 20 years is true but but i think it's really important to, to get back to that and the second thing you talk about this year and the next challenge increasingly what what we see in our um, through the research that we are doing is a new phase in the in the in reshaping the the, the communication system and I'm sure you follow all these discussions about the, the, the emergence of metaverses and, and all that. Um, I'm not sure how much of that will, will help or, or not help journalism, but definitely there is a new moment in, in the redefinition and reshaping the technology systems that, that power of all, all economic fields and journalism. And this is really important. Uh, I, I don't know what that will be, but when, when the internet happened, when the, the new technologies emerged 15, 20 years ago, many fields uh, adjusted. 
And if you really think back, journalists and the journalism field more or less missed that point. And the, 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 the large networks that we have today were built by by people in technology, by the Silicon Valley. Um, and I now at this moment, once these uh, forms of engaging uh, with, uh, with people are changing again, I think we have, we have to follow that and, and to be part of that and not miss it again. Thank you. Um, I welcome anyone else to come into the conversation. We have uh, about uh, five or six minutes left. Let me um, work with what Adam posed and the comments that everyone has shared uh, to suggest um, uh, a line of activity, an area of action for 2022 that Adam and Susan and I have uh, discussed separately, which is uh, moving towards uh, a new theory of change related to the, the problem, the big problem of mediating difference in society with the prevailing disinformation and breakdown in information order as being fundamental um, concerns that we have to address that are obviously uh, impeding or inhibiting the mediation of difference um, uh, in society. Because we've been hearing in this conversation, we all know from our various practice areas that there are uh, many different potential inputs into a new theory of change that we might look at. But it's just uh, a way of thinking about how we might move forward in, in 2022 that we take into account then, uh, Bukasin, as you were saying, social behavior change communication, which is not typically in the conversation. We take into account the notion of building strong communities, digital communities that Jacqueline was talking about. We take into account the need, Morris was saying, for a policy concern. Barbara's concerns about fixing um, the digital marketplaces. We, we take these into account, um, but we look at this bigger problem that societies are increasingly polarized, they're breaking down and potentially into conflict and violence, and that uh, we need a, a to this rethink and a new approach. So um, that would be at least one way of thinking about how we would move forward into, into 2022. I put that out for the group's uh, consideration. That and any other thoughts you'd like to share with us in the time that we have uh, remaining, please, anybody come into the conversation. Susan, Adam, I certainly, uh, defer to the two of you to add any additional thoughts. Um, I just wanted to throw in there that, I don't know, Francois, are you still with us? I don't know if you can hear us or if you've stepped away from your computer. Um, I think- I, I am here. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, I just wondered if you might say a few words about yourself and your work and what, what you're hearing, because you come at this at a different kind of level than your kind of usual democracy promotion, you know, CSOs, NGOs, and that kind of industry, you, you're more on the, the front lines of working with tech companies and the media industry. And I thought maybe it'd be interesting for you to share a little bit about yourself and your reactions to this discussion. Um, uh, thanks, Susan, and thank you everybody for putting me on the spot. Um, I'm Francois Nell, I'm, I'm based in the UK. And I work in leadership and innovation development um, as my day job, but I also do world press trends and other insight reports for the industry. Um, so, I mean, it, um, this is a fascinating conversation, obviously. Um, one of the things um, I was pleased to hear um, Adam say in the beginning um, of this last phase of the conversation is that um, we, we need to explore the alternative um, interventions that we can have, but we can't forget that, you know, if the Adams or if the Arab Spring and any of these other um, democratic initiatives um, or movements have shown us is that you can't have it's easy to break down a society than to rebuild one. And that we do need the power structures in society as reference points, um, whether or not they are faulty reference points or need to be reformed or they've been captured or whatever. But in this massive information ecosystem, um, we do need some reference points. And most of the um, 
and our work to support that, I think, is important. Um, for me, um, just 2022, I think um, we've got a couple of things on our agenda. Um, certainly one of that is to have a really um, a deeper understanding of the information ecosystem of communities. Um, I think we have market information, we have all sorts of pockets of information, and but we don't really have a, um, a, a deep understanding about how people, including young people that was mentioned and, and other segments, actually get information. Um, we don't have a we make big assumptions around that. Um, and that's certainly research that, that I've been um, engaged in with and, and keen to do more of in different contexts. And, and so um, I know that that's been on the agenda for a long time since the, you know, the American report on the, the critical information needs of communities, but I think that's an evolving question and we still don't have proper answers for that, that we can share. Um, I, in, in terms of the other question, that's the only other thing I want to say in terms of Adam, um, uh, as question, what else do we do? Um, you, pr you probably noticed from my, um, from my, accent that I have some Southern African roots, um, but I spent quite a bit of my time covering the um, South African democratic um, move to uh, democracy. And one of the things that I always remembered Bishop Tutu saying is that you have to have channels of communication. And whatever else we do here is how do we maintain how do small and big initiatives um, maintain a discourse between and amongst different communities? I think that should be our focus, not necessarily that we can control those discourses, but actually striving to, to provide spaces with, for these discourses. And I think that that, that you know, understanding the information space better on the other one and doing all we can in small and big ways to maintain communication, I think is the two things. Francois, that's great. I, thank you very much for that. Um, we are um, out of time at this point. Um, uh, several of our panelists, Jacqueline Slobodan, had, uh, had to sign off. And I know others of you are going to have to run, given the time commitment that you've made to this. We want to thank you uh, for joining us. We're very appreciative. The panelists, uh, um, uh, Bukasin and Marius, uh, thank you so much. Um, obviously, thanks to Adam and Susan. Adam and Susan, if you'd like to uh, have a final word, please, please do. And then we will, uh, as we indicated to everyone, prepare a report to the organizers of the forum and then look at what 2022 holds and hope to be back in touch with you. So, Susan and Adam, any final thoughts? Yeah, just to say thanks to all the, the panelists and for people uh, jumping in. Um, I think we do want to kind of carry this forward and Francois, I like your point about maybe thinking about the research agenda and maybe crowdsourcing some new directions on that. Um, and I like this idea that Marius proposed about working with universities. And I, I might, I wonder if there might be some universities connected in a lot of the communities we work in and with, if there are good partners. I know uh, Francois, your university and Marius is at uh, the Central uh, European University, which is jointly located now in Budapest in Vienna. Um, you know, are potential conduits that we could work with and through. Um, and I think in terms of the year of action, you know, we have different fora coming up. There's the um, RightsCon, uh, which will be online. There's MissInfoCon. There's different places we can engage, but I might suggest that we think of the non-usual suspect places, like who else needs to hear these messages and are there other communities in civil society that we could engage with? And it would be great to hear people's thoughts on that. And you could send us emails. I'll put my email in the text box if people want to be in touch. Thank you. Adam. 
Yeah, I just want to thank the, the those of us who are still here. Thank and those who, who had to leave. This has been uh, this has been very very helpful to me personally. I think it has surfaced an, for me a number of ideas that I were were maybe weak signals in my own mind, but were um, uh, now reinforced. Let me, if I can, just take thirty seconds here to make a couple of connections. Um, one, uh, uh, Lucas, and absolutely, it's about values. Um, because that is the way that people make decisions, and that is what motivates them to either affect or not affect a, a given situation that they're involved in. And then, Francois, you're absolutely right. I think a focus on the systems of communication versus the content of those communications. People will fo will find information value where they need it, where, where, they, where they can. They will triangulate. They will do whatever they need to do in order to extract whatever, whatever value they can from their information. If that value connecting those two ideas if that value is based, if their, that value of information is based on their values, and even better, shared values amongst a broader community of people who have similar aspirations for their own society, then maybe that is a space where an aspirational vision of change might be able to be incubated and be and moved upon. And it doesn't mean that we would completely ostracize facts. But we would recognize through media literacy that we are in fact being pulled and pushed and forced into boxes that we may not necessarily agree with because those are the only realms of information that, that are being, being proffered to us. So maybe as a, as, as, a, as a focus kind of moving forward, what are the examples around the world of this? I, I'm not sure who it was who put the idea of this group in Yemen right in in the chat related to a community of conversation amongst Yemeni youth very very exciting similarly I, this Lebanon didn't get to touch on it but his community of youth that are content creators in 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 Bosnia who are making very very interesting content that is calling the 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 calling to account the fracturing of that society and the forcing of youth to, to ascribe to a specific political or informational side. All of these things are interesting. I think there's great work that can be done. We just need to kind of lean in on it and recognize the full problem set. So again, thank you, everybody. This, is, this has been very, very uh, useful for us, and uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks, Adam. And that was, by the way, Jacqueline, who had mentioned that uh, with r and media support of the, of the uh, group in Yemen, which is a dynamic community that's now self-sustaining and it's ongoing. Um, just a final note on the social behavior change communication piece. This is one community that um, I think that we all would want to connect with as part of this ongoing discussion. And by the way, um, it is led by a number of institutions, but one of the uh, principal leaders is the Center for Communication Programs at Johns Hopkins University. So if you haven't um, uh, explored uh, Center for Communication Programs, just Google that. And also it's been postponed now for, gosh, two years because of COVID, but due to take place this year in September is the biennial um, uh, SBCC, Social Behavior, Social Behavior Change Communication Conference in Marrakesh, Morocco, which will, which will gather um, thousands of practitioners who are kindred spirits to everything we're talking about. We just don't routinely engage them, those of us that have been in the typical traditional media development world focus more on fact-based information and strengthening those systems. We haven't gone over to those that are using uh, communication for achievement of sustainable development goals. And that's a fruitful area of collaboration, I think, that we'd want to explore. Again, on my, on my behalf, on, on my side, I just want to thank everybody. I, we are out of time. So we will follow up. We'll issue our report to the group, and we hope to be back in touch with all of you. So thank you. Thank you very much for joining. Happy holidays to everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.